I drink your milkshake. You are listening to the Billionaire Podcast Network. Welcome to Lost in the Maze number 20. Lost in the Maze is the solo show that I do over here on the Billionaire Podcast Network. Ka-ching! Bing, 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 bing. Did, did you feel rough? <laughs> really committed to doing that station tag every time I say the name of the network. And... Boy, it gets me every time. But yes, welcome to Lost in the Maze. I've been, I I keep slacking on these. These have become irregular, uh, much like my bowels. That's not true. I have very regular bowels. I never understood that as a kid. The commercials about uh, where it was older people who, I guess, were having trouble taking shits. There were so many, they still exist, these products still exist, I I suppose, just um, different powders and yogurts and pills and stuff that people have to take so that they can uh, take dumps during the day, and I, I wonder, I've never had an issue with shitting, I've always been very good, if I, look, if I'm good at one thing in this life, I can really pride myself on something, Something I've always been very good at, it's shitting. I've always been great at taking dumps. And I average probably two a day. I'm probably taking it if we were to if we were to chart out 30 days worth of dumps. Um, yeah, we we would probably be looking at a mean number, uh a, a mean which is a is that an, is the mean the average? An average, a mean of two uh, healthy dumps a day, and and you know because yeah, and that's that's factoring in you know some days maybe I'm only taking one dump, and other days maybe taking three or four, and I think you know when you get when you get the sample size together, the stool sample size, <laughs> when you get all that together and you average it out, we're probably looking at two good two dumps a day on average maybe like a two you know this hey it's me dave portnoy with the one dump challenge you know the rules taking a shit uh it's a solid 2.5 on the bristol stool chart the the one the one dump challenge (laughs) but yeah so i'm probably taking two healthy dumps a day i've never it's never been an issue for me and granted i'm not a senior citizen i am not old um, some would say I am. My generation would say I am. My generation's a bunch of fucking pussies. They hit a certain age and they're like, oh, my joints and I got to go to bed at a certain hour. And I'm so old now. I'm so old because I was born in 1995. I'm so old. It's like, all right, man, you know, sp- speak for yourself. Uh, I refuse to buy into that. I don't know what happened there. I don't know what psyop infected our minds or how we were indoctrinated my generation into believing that 
the age just say age 28 it's over get ready then your knees are gonna hurt your ankles pop and, and it's time to go to bed at 8 8, 8 p.m every night it's insane to me how my generation it just has given the fuck up they they are just i and i felt that years ago i remember being like in my early 20s and hanging out with elder millennials people you know who were born in like like the mid to late 80s right and these are people who at the time were in their early 30s i think yeah they were probably in their like late 20s early 30s and like the way they would talk about themselves the way they would like discuss just their their like overall maladies and aches and pains and bedtimes and vitamins and all this shit they got to do to keep ticking it would just just bother me to no end because th this is not the this is not the age when the party stops. Now is not the time for the party to stop in, in your late 20s, early 30s. The party's just getting going, I would say. <laughs> As someone who's lived a responsible and stable life who uh, can justify these remarks, I would say the party is just getting started. It's I it's not I don't you know you definitely there I would say like your heavy heavy drinking days are certainly behind you at these ages I would hope uh, I don't know how anyone could drink the way they do they did in college forever um, but man my my generation has is really just given up on living just living it up. And, you know, you got 32-year-olds who are out there, just talk, like, literally saying things like, I'm an old man now, I'm 32. And, you know, bitch, I, this is, like, the best it's ever been for humans. 32-year-olds now look like little babies. They look like 12-year-olds. One of my favorite things to do is, because I grew up watching, is I watch the Twilight Zone all the time. You know, the, the old Twilight Zone from, like, the late 50s and then up. Uh, you know, 59 through however long it was on through 63, 64. And it's, it's really jarring ju just how shitty everyone looked at that time. Rod Serling at the beginning of that show, at the, I think when the show starts in 59, Rod Serling is 35 years old and he looks like he's on death's door. He looks like, he looks like dog shit. He looks so fucking old and he's, he's, you know, he's the showrunner. He's probably, he's maybe may be the oldest person involved with the show at that point. I don't, like, I don't know, but he, he looks like shit and he's only 35. And then everyone in every episode, all the cast members, like the characters in every episode, they look like they're in there like mid, you know, Rod Serling looks like he's 70 and he's 35. And then all the characters look like they're maybe in their 40s or 50s. And they're in their like mid to late 20s, maybe. And, and it's uh, you know, I'm using this example because it's it's a show from that time I I watch all the time. It, it, but it's like you would you would notice the same thing with anything from that era. And it's really it's, it's stark, it's jarring because it like we are living the like the cleanest we've ever lived we like we have achieved longevity and just overall uh well like well-being the likes of which the human race has never known but back then people were fucking living dude they didn't like, you know 30s 40s 50s they were dude they were drinking like scotch with every meal and taking like dexedrine and fin fin all the time and smoking like 40 cigarettes a day and granted that you know I think the average lifespan at that time was maybe you know 45 46 but they didn't they didn't give up and i think a lot of the uh health uh, maladies the the detriments to health at that time were not even due to as much to what people were doing to themselves but just due to environmental factors i mean there was lead everywhere there was lead in the gasoline lead in the air people were people were dumber because of this and they were po just being poisoned walking around and and all the food sucked like if you think food sucks now like now knowing what we know about processed food now and, and what to look out for that wasn't it, it, it was exponentially worse back then because 
Pro- nobody knew what processed food was. Nobody had heard in hide nor hair of a gluten or a seed oil or, or a factory farm. They thought all, like all this was healthy. It was like being touted as the best, the best thing ever, like canned food and margarine and meat in a can, and, uh, just, you know, processed food was the, that was the, the bee's knees at that time. So, Nobody, and, and you know, the bread was the foundation of health and wellness. Everybody had to eat a loaf of bread every day and, and wash it down with a gallon of milk. That was how you had to to live to be healthy. And, and so nobody knew, nobody knew what they were doing. It was scotch, dexedrine, fin fin, bread, milk, and lead was every was everybody's you know nutritional intake. And, but they, but no one ever, you know, no one ever acted like they were old. They just looked like shit, but they were having good, they were having a good ass time. And now we all look like we're babies. We've, our youth is eternal now, or it's, it's certainly, you know, lasts longer, but we're acting like big, just giant fucking pussies. I was talking to my co-host the other day, Kevin. And he said that to me. We were on the phone, and he said, "Yeah, you know, I'm a, we're old men now." And I go, "What the fu- what the fuck are you talking about? You like that? that the, the, speak for yourself. You know, you have gout, and you're drinking forty Michelob Ultras a night. You just feel like shit. <laughs> you just feel bad because you're not taking care of yourself. But we're not old. Nobody's ever old. Nobody's ever old. Not not in the grand scheme of things, relative to." Uh, time itself we're only here for a brief moment we never get a chance to be old we only get a chance to experience this time and we feel as though we've experienced more relative to ourselves hold on i this thought is falling apart on me <clears throat> we never get to be old old you know, we only we we experience we have our perception of time and we live to a certain age and that, you know, to us, through from our perspective, that's old. But, you know, it's a it's a grain of sand on a vast, endless beach. You know what I mean? But back to dumps. <clears throat> They when I was a uh, I when I still watched TV and saw the commercials, there were tons of commercials about how to shit normal. You know, there was Metamucil and fiber cereal, all these like dog food cereals. You know, like a cereal that looked like dog food that you're supposed to eat so that your bowels function the right way. Jamie Lee Curtis was trying to sell her doo doo yogurt. You know, if you if you eat the Activia, you can take a doo doo. The way you're supposed to, the way you do, do do the way you do, the way you supposed supposed to with Activia, you know, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff on the market to to make sure that people take good, healthy, solid solids important, good solid logs uh, is a good is a sign of gut health. If you're shitting regularly and they're solid logs, that's how you know you're you're doing the right thing because if you have, um watery slippery doo-doos and that can you know lean into diarrhea so anywhere from from slip sloppery uh logs to diarrhea is is a sign that you're doing something wrong and then i think if you if your logs are too hard or if it's like dense hard rabbit pellets that's also you want like a good continuous like you know six seven inch log that, that's a sign of gut health but i you know overall you just want to be shitting you know you want to shit at least once a day they say right you want to have at least one good hefty bowel movement every day and i've never struggled in that regard and uh i don't i don't know what causes people to get backed up i've never had a constipation that i thought was a problem i've never had like days and days and days where i just didn't shit and it was it was like becoming an issue for me i there was when i was a kid i will say this i do remember when i was a kid and i was like getting potty trained and i had to start shitting on my own that i was averse to it i didn't want to have to go take a dump by myself 
And so I became what it, what they call anal retentive, uh, which sounds like my fucking wife, if you know what I mean. No, I, I became anal retentive, so I just refused to go shit. And so then, like, I was, you, you know, through sheer force of will and, and um, my own uh, behavior, my, my, my own... Uh, uh, um, it, it, uh, what was the word I'm looking for? Yeah, just I, I don't know. My, I was willing myself to not shit. I was making a conscious decision to not go take a dump. Uh, it was by my my own autonomy, my own volition, in defiance of God, and and what the universe demands of me. I said, "Nay, God, I shall not shit, for I am a man of of his own machinations and free will." And though you may tell me I must shit, I on this day I shall not shit. And so I became compacted. And then I physically could not shit at that point. Uh, there was too much in there, and it was blocking up my uh, my little boy hole. So my parents had to take me to a doctor and have him root around inside my ass to break it up. And then and then I and then I just shit some uh, some real hard like clay bricks. <clears throat> and then that never happened again. And then all throughout my life, I've, you know, just never really had an issue with it. I've, I mean, I've had, I've, I've like shit my pants. I've shit on accident more than I've not been able to shit. You know what I mean? Like I, everything's running at, at almost too, too good. It's, it's going into overdrive sometimes and I'm taking dumps when I don't even, I'm not even trying to, I don't even want to. That's how good my bowels are. I'll just be walking around a Costco. Whoops. Got I just shit my britches. Got to go in the bathroom and wash them out. Toss the underwear. Are you supposed to toss the underwear? Because my here's the thing: if I shit my britches, and I understandably like I have doo doo in my in my underwear at that point, so I got to figure something out. I can't just leave the doo doo there. So I'm going to make some effort to clean it out. And they say you know a lot of people will just like throw them away, but here's my thinking: as someone who's shit his pants many times in his life. It's the only underwear I have. And and so I my plan if I shit my pants is I'm gonna try and clean out as much shit as I can and keep the underwear just as a contingency. I'm planning in case I shit myself again. That way I I'm not shitting straight onto my jeans. You know what I mean? Cause like, yeah, I mean, I understand wanting to throw away the underwear if you shit your britches. But then if you throw away the underwear, you got like you have no shielding. You have no safeguard betwixt your cheeks and bri- and and uh draw- pants. Betwixt cheeks and pants, there's no uh shield. There's no portcullis that is the underwear to block the the shit. So if I toss my underwear and I happen to shit myself again, you know, at some point, then, then now I, I don't even know at that point, you know, we're, we're at DEFCON one do, do, do DEFCON one in, with that situation because I've shit directly into my jeans with no underwear to provide a barrier, but you know, b- between, uh, do, do and jeans. So the, you know, the last time I shit my britches, I just, I kept the underwear on. And it, just in case I shit again, that you know I still have that um, shielding. But other other people have told me I'm mad that if one is to shit his britches, the underwear must be tossed. And, and so I, you know, uh, folks, I guess uh, right into the show. How long have I been talking about doo doo? <laughs> How did I get on this? Um, oh, this show, oh, I, <laughs> I said this show, this show has become irregular. I've not been doing it. I, I was trying to keep it routine. I was trying to keep it once a week on the same day, same time every week. And I was doing that for a while. And then I started to falter as other v- variables uh, became apparent or, or manifested and and just uh you know my my own in my own life uh all the thing all the plates i gotta spend in my own life i've also just been playing around with the internet like you know i know a lot of uh channels and podcasts or whatever have everyone conditioned 
to routine and, and um, uh, schedules that the the show it must adhere to this uh, schedule, the same schedule every week. Uh, I have liberated myself. I freed my mind. There is no schedule. There's no routine anymore with any of this. I don't know why. I really don't understand why anybody's abiding by the same models that we were um, e- e- uh, indoctrinated with due to old legacy media. Because it's all born from that. All these trends are born from what we were we had become accustomed to due to the media being controlled by um the government and corporations and, and existing as a very narrow window and now it's it's opened up completely and i mean yeah that, that's not to say there's not still tons and tons of corporate and government influence that is like manipulating what the media is now but you know i'm not beholden to fucking anybody with with any of this i just do all of this myself and i'm i'm my own boss i make $65 a month doing this. So I, you know, I fuck you. <laughs> I do what I want. <laughs> That's what I say to the man. All right. I I escaped the I escaped the matrix. I'm making $65 a month on YouTube doing this. And I, I answer to no man or company or anybody. Um <laughs> I guess it is. It is good to have a schedule. You know, people, the people that pay attention, that are fans, enjoyers of what one does, uh, become accustomed to uh, that that notification coming around each week. And when it doesn't happen, they they start autistically screeching about it and uh, reaching out to the person, like, "Where's the episode?" or you know that that kind of thing. Um. But I do, yeah. I, I I've been taking a different approach with everything. I um, I just I just play around with it. Like to me, I've I've just been like treating all of this like a big sandbox. This is like what if if there's any, if there's any upside to what happened to me, and I think I think like more and more people are starting to discover who I am, and then the people who knew about me, who maybe just thought I died, like I went away, and they're they're now finding out that I'm back doing stuff. Or finding me again so i did like maybe a lot of people don't know what happened but if there is one benefit to what's happened to me my uh health issues my mental <clears throat> decline and uh, descent into madness that uh led me to this point in time to this place is i don't have anything else to lose and i have no one to impress I'm not playing the game. I'm not playing any game anymore with or for anybody. You know, I like I don't I don't know what it looks like to everyone else, like looking in, but like that though the whole like media and entertainment and comedy and all of it and like what I was experiencing pursuing these things in in the big city with all of these people is it's a lot. It's a lot of feels like high school. Like a lot of people just like have recreated um, high school and the, that kind of structure, the, like all the, the these different cliques form and it's everybody's very insecure and worried about what other people think of them and trying to impress the right people. And they don't want to, you know, no one wants to seem like a horse's ass and, and say or do the wrong thing or do something embarrassing that everyone's going to remember for the next four years and you're just waiting to graduate so you can get away from these people except like with you know all of this there is no graduation there's no getting away from anybody you're just in it forever so you're constantly um you know working to appease people who uh probably don't even like you or respect you and uh really don't even don't really give a shit about you at all I, i it just it always it always felt like this very bizarre popularity contest, like this um this simulacrum of high school, this this facsimile of high school in in which you know every people are trying to make tons of money as entertainers. And it's just everybody's so concerned with seeming uncool or doing the wrong thing or not being this and that 
not fitting into the mold that they, they you know no one's really exploring or doing anything necessarily interesting <clears throat> And there, I mean, and there are there's some that are there's some really talented, uh, cool uh, people out there. They're doing like really cool, fun, exciting uh, things. And then there's a lot of people who are just following trends and playing the game and, and saying the things and doing the things that uh, will get everyone to like them. And then all of you the uh, you know audience just the the folk out there who consume these things glom onto these figures and, and project yourselves onto them and become sycophants to for to the to for them you know you you, you start to you cling on to these entertainers as, as though you have some skin in the game as though that the, you have anything at stake and you want to see them succeed so bad and then any criticism or negative thought or word levied against them you know you as an audience as a person just out there consuming these things you take such great umbrage with it that you feel like you have to come you know you have to come at me you have to come at those of us brave enough to speak out against these these jesters these uh these flim flam artists <clears throat> Which is fine, you know. Criticize, you know, criticize me all you want. Criticize everything, honestly. Like, I, I mean, that's 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 a, that's like my whole thing is just like, I, obviously, I respect a lot of these people, but I also enjoy shitting on them. <laughs> it's just fun, and it doesn't it doesn't hurt them, and it honestly it shouldn't hurt me. Like I like just being a shit talker is just fun. It's fun to hate things and talk shit. And if I'm actually talented, that'll show through. And so then, you know, fuck you. You you see that I can do, I have the goods. I can do the thing that I say I can do. And I can also talk shit. And I, what, I'm not on the right rung on the ladder to talk shit? Look, this is, we don't get much in this life. You know, we're born naked. We die naked. And, and the time in between is spent screaming, crying to the heavens, wondering why God. If there's one thing that we have, if there's if there's one freedom, one action that we have on this earth, it's hate. You know, it's the ability to hate people and talk shit and, and be and just be an overall dickhead about uh what people do and the things they try to achieve. <clears throat> and so I I believe in that. I think every uh, each and every one of you has it in you to really hate. And, and be and, and be a, be a hater, and don't ever let anyone tell you that that's a bad thing. Don't ever let anyone try to take that away from you. Don't let these people try to tell you that you know you're you're just being a hater. You're a loser for hating. That that you should be positive and and uh, offer your undying loyalty and support to what they do because they're chasing their dreams. No, fuck them. Fuck them. They're doing the same thing everyone else is trying to do, which is find a way out, find a way to get a bunch of money. And not have to to live the daily grind. That sucks. And if they're talented, it's great. It brings a lot of joy to everyone. And if they're not talented, you know what you know what joy it brings to us? We get to hate them. We get to shit on them. They get become a figure that we love to hate. And don't I don't want anyone to take that away from me. I don't want anyone to take it away from you. Hate me and hate everyone else. Hate, hate, hate. It's it's fun to hate things. <laughs> And I've 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 just been I've been encountering that so much lately, where I'll, I'll not even not even like hating anyone, just criticizing certain people's creative output, just like actually observing it and coming at it from a place of actual criticism. And uh, people will say, yeah, "You wish you were this guy. You sound like such a, you know, he's everything you wish you were." And it's like I, that wasn't even. He's not. First off, he, like his the his the his comfortability in life is something I wish I had. But what he what this person is doing creatively and the way he's living is not what I don't want. This I just want the you know the money and the apartment and the car. <laughs> but I don't want to do what he's doing as an artist as a person. Um, but the, yeah, people are so quick to like defend these people who wouldn't fucking piss on you if you were on fire i experienced that this week with that um who's that guy one of tony hinchcliffe's bitch boys 
David Lucas, you know, he, he told some hack George Floyd joke that got him in some hot water. And it was, it, it wasn't even, it was nothing. He's not successful enough for this to be an issue. He's not at any point in his career or, or in, in the public eye for this to be anything that anyone gives a shit about. It was just a, a quick thing that happened online. If anything, it could only help him. It can only raise his profile. But he bitch made himself. He bitch made himself and, and uh, capitulated and posted this weepy selfie video in which he's apologizing uh, about what he's done and not even addressing the fact that the joke itself just sucked it wasn't even the subject it wasn't the fact that he was making fun of the george floyd um murder when george floyd was murdered by Derek chauvin or when he or died of a fentanyl overdose you know whatever however you feel about that but whatever hey whatever you feel about that one um but I saw the joke he told. It just it was just a shitty joke. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily offensive. It just sucked. And, and um, but he po- so he but he posted that that like weepy apology video, and I I just went through and just added smoke alarm chirps to it. <laughs> I'm sure people, you know, I'm sure some folks have seen that. that I posted that. the funny thing. The funniest thing about that is I posted that. And there's a lot of people who just think that's real. Like I've had so many people comment on it and be like, "Why don't they ever change their batteries?" <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, I guess, I guess no one saw the original video or knows what this is," I, which proves my point, which is that he is not successful or famous or noteworthy because, ne- like, no, I posted on my feed like people that follow me. I don't think had any clue who this was. And had not seen or heard this about this story or saw that original video, so it was, it was like it would have th- th- that whole fucking thing would have gone away. And by the way, I'll say this about this because like the culture war is over or it's ending. All that identity politics shit, the cancel culture, all that kind of stuff. That was that was a, a there was a window for that of a few years, and it's over now. And the interesting thing about this that I noticed with this David Lucas thing is there were there were people uh who really need there to be a culture war a cancel culture um phenomenon happening in order to ha- actually have careers they 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 were salivating over this they were ready to start like gear like gearing up for those arguments they used to love to have about freedom of speech and expression and uh, offend everyone all the time like i saw chrissy mayer post this like fucking diatribe about uh how the woke mob is gonna come after you and it's like nobody gives a shit that that's all over and you motherfuckers are cooked on that shit because he ain't none of you if if you're smart enough to know what's like what you're doing maybe you're just not willing to admit it but i'm willing to bet maybe they don't even realize they might just be too stupid to understand. They fucking needed that culture war shit in order to have any relevance and for anyone to like really appreciate what they were doing because that provided for them the friction that that, that they needed to generate some like interest in what they have to do. Because when that's not there, when when that like that you know opposing force to push back against is not there, what's revealed is these motherfuckers ain't got a goddamn thing to say that's interesting or entertaining or worthwhile. And that does not mean they don't get to have careers. They get to have like pretty good careers, all things considered without it. Like, you know, when all that was happening, they got to be like big media figures. They got to go on all the Fox news shows and, you know, may, you know, go viral on the internet and make a big fuss all the time and, and become champions of free speech and Liberty and it, you know, it was a boon to their careers. And without it, they get to be road hacks, which is not a bad career, to be honest with you. A lot of uh, entertainers and comedians would lament that, but getting to go do a comedy club every weekend is is there's so, <laughs> it's a good way to make a living. You get to do that. You get to have your podcast that people tune into. You get you you like you've you still cheated the system. You've achieved a job like you're making a living doing a job that's not real. So you won, and but 
you're not willing to look in the mirror and admit to yourself that you know the 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 uh, the 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 Joker has lost his Batman and uh, or the Batman has lost his Joker, whatever it may be, and now finds finds himself empty inside, you know, now realizing that this this dance that the two were doing throughout Gotham was what was keeping them invigorated. And now that the other has perished, you know, what, 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 what life is this now? And now the, uh, you know, if the Batman has lost the Joker, now the Batman is going insane. And if the, you know, the Joker has lost his Batman, the Joker is going sane, uh, getting, you know, studying for real estate or something. You, you know, you get what I'm trying to say here. It's, it's, uh, the yin and yang, the light and the shadow need each other. And these people just, you know, either they realize it and just, you know, will not admit it and, and or they're too stupid to realize this. But I did notice that when this when this shit popped off with this David Lucas guy, there were some people who, you know, were like, oh, you know, it's been it's been a while since we've we've fed since we've been able to feed as van as a uh, um, reactionary cultural vampires that we are um <laughs> but yeah so i well, yeah i posted that with you yeah, i put some smoke alarm chirps in that i'm truly an agent of chaos i'm twisted uh i i am i am more unhinged these days than i've ever been it feels nice i'm liberated i'm i'm free baby i'm just i'm just horny publicly all the time on the internet it's like <laughs> like you know i know there's guys who will go into a woman's dms and and try and hit her up or riz her up i'm no i'm public i'm in the comments saying some wild shit and i got banned recently i got got a 12 hour ban on twitter because of that shit because there's that one influencer that streamer um big titties susu she posted a third, like a, a titty picture, a thirst trap where titties were prominently uh, positioned, you know, you know, in the photo. And uh, I forget what her caption said, but I was, I went in the comments and I said, imagine my penis between your breasts. How cool does that sound? And then a few hours later, I got a notification that said, well, your account's locked because of this. And, you know, you can look at it and read other tweets, but. You're in timeout for 12 hours. And, you know, unlike the the last time my account got suspended, I had to look at this one. I had to take my lumps on this one. I had to say, all right, that's fair. I deserve this. That was that was one toke over the line. I can't be that uh, violently horny. Um, not, you know, not that I was mentioning any threat of violence or had any desire to do violence, but the the horniness itself, is in at violent proportions is just too horny is at the level where it's it can come across as harassment to to ask a woman to picture in her mind my penis between her breasts is is too much it's too far um but you know other than that uh i'm i'm just you know i am definitely haha pilled <laughs> i'm haha pilled for sure which is something I talked about with a dear, dear friend, friend of the show, Femoid, Lava Looney, uh, open invite, dear friend of the show, Femoid. <laughs> Cause that was something we talked about. If you haven't watched that, yeah, go watch that. But yeah, she mentioned that she's jester maxing. She's a ha ha pilled jester maxing Joker cell. And I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm not where she is. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be where she is, uh, on that. Um, on the the spectrum of of joker the joker spectrum but man i'm certainly just crazy now uh you know in ter- in terms of the way i interact with people in my own personal life i'm just boring i'm just doing sales and just trying to like build my life back up and live a normal life but in terms of what i uh perform the the persona i've crafted and show to people and the thing you know what i do publicly unhinged (laughs) um 
And, you know, speaking of, I am now foot-pilled. I'm also, I'm a foot-pilled, uh, soul-maxing, uh, to, uh, toe, wait, foot-pilled, soul-maxing toe cell. Um, I, there's someone I, someone I follow, I've, I, I've, I've mentioned this a couple times before on some other things. Someone I follow posted a, a picture of her feet and I don't know what it was about this particular photo, but it finally, it, it this finally foot pilled me and unlocked something within me that I was just like, cause like probably, you know, before I was, I was neutral on feet prior to this. I was, I didn't care one way or the other. And as a sexual proclivity, it always seemed just like pretty tame to me. I never thought it was like odd in any way. Like, uh, yeah, but a bitch's feet are nice. Sure. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't see any issue with this. Like in terms of like what people are in, like can and are in, can be and are into just liking, enjoying looking at feet and touching them and maybe tasting them or, you know, whatever, like having a thing for feet seems like pretty pedestrian compared to like some of the other like crazy shit people are getting into. I never understood like the the way people would talk about like guys with foot fetishes or foot kinks where they, they thought it was just this like really fringe, strange uh, uh, thing to be attracted to a woman's feet and it's like have you seen like what people are like other people are doing like what they're up to pissing on each other and slat smacking each other around waterboarding one another uh having sex with robots uh elbow deep fisting all the you know whatever's out there bondage fin dom which i'm into i'm doing fin dom now by the way but we you know more on that in a minute maybe but the, yeah, the foot thing was always, you know, never cared one way or the other. I was neutral on it. Every now and then I'd see a nice pair of feet and go, Ooh, okay, I like those. Not bad. But I was more of a titties guy. I was always, I was always very pro titty. And then butt cheeks came around. I was like, butt cheeks are nice. I like titties, butt cheeks. Um, A woman's face is always pretty to me. Uh, You know, there's a lot to enjoy about a woman's body. For sure. Um, cis and trans, you know, we don't uh we don't exclude anyone here. Um <laughs> but then this this one woman posted a picture of her dirty feet and it dude, yeah, it uh it opens up it opens something up inside of me. So I had to go through her profile and start uh finding all all the other pictures she posted of her feet and save them to my phone. Um I've been getting some mileage out of those. I'm getting some mileage out of these photos. Uh, and I know I could go look up any number of wild uh, Nickelodeon ass foot things that are out there. Um, probably a bad example I just used if I am to talk about uh, uh, the, the foot proclivity Nickelodeon. That is um, that's a bad one to bring up in this regard, considering what we now know about Dan Schneider. Uh, but that was just the first thing I thought of thinking of feet was the, the weird Nick of Nickelodeon foot stuff. But we know, you know, we know why that is the case now. Um, we know why there were so many feet and feet like imagery associated with Nickelodeon, at least when I was a child, maybe that's why people are so averse to, to foot things and foot guys is because it's usually, if a guy is in the feet, it's like symptomatic of some other dark, twisted um, desire that he has. That the the foot is is merely the uh, mundane masquerade, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's veiling the uh, sinister underbelly of his heart. Which for Dan Schneider would be um, pederasty, uh, but that's not the case for me. Uh, I just like a bitch's feet, a grown bitch, <clears throat> and not all the time. You know, it has to be well, honestly. And I will say this: it's a like it's a verite thing, also for me, because I know I can go to any porn site and just type in feet, 
and I'll, you know, there'll be a thousand pages of me to rifle for me to rifle through of every, you know, every nook and cranny uh, that, has, that has to do with feet. But that's boring. It's too accessible. And it's like, you know, uh, you know, feet or feet. There's plenty of them on all the porn sites. It's more, it, it's more of a verite, uh, just a raw grounded connection with the, the, with the foot, with the feet, because the person to which I'm referring is someone I've interacted with on the internet prior to this. I've never met her in person, but we, you know, we've interacted, we've had a good time on the internet. And, and so just like that sort of connection that we have is like mutuals, I suppose. Oops oomphs as they call them now whatever the fuck that means um so you know when a bitch like that posts a picture of her feet it's like okay i'm in i i like seeing this and i think i and i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that i know this person with that there's some level of intimacy between us very very minimal very surface level when i when i say the word intimate i just mean like there is a real human connection between us, but it's, it's separated by miles and miles and it exists in a vast web of ones and zeros, but it's there nonetheless, you know, that, that which is human exists between us and it makes it easy for me to pop off to a picture of her dirty feet is what I'm getting at. <clears throat> um, and you know, I will say, does this mean that this is my thing? That this is like what I'm all about? My Tarantino guy now? No, now, no, no. Titties all day, titties day in day out, all day every day. Titties, uh, we going we going hard on titties for sure. In my in my book, it goes, it goes titties, butt cheeks, face, pussy. Uh, feet and feet being the titties of the legs <clears throat> so to speak um but it is it is it is a cool thing you know i've always i've always thought this that you know a woman's feet is a cool thing to be attracted to because you have so much like easier access to looking at them than you do any other part of you know other parts of her body usually because like women women tend to more more than other uh, creatures <laughs> i don't know women like uh wear more open toed like open footwear where you have more you view of the of the of the foot you, you have more access to looking at feet on a woman than than like other parts of her and if if one is to have sexualized a woman a bitch's feet in his mind you know, just in your daily goings ons, you have access to so many bare feet. Uh, you know, if a bitch is wearing flip flops or if she's at the beach and she's barefoot, it's you know, it's not uncommon to see a bare foot just out and about. It, it, you know, it's it's certainly more common than seeing bare bare titties, bare breasts, which I have seen in the wild, and it's always. It's kind of jarring. It's like really stuck. It reminds me of when people started saying fuck on TV. I was like, whoa, 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 that's, this is not the place for that, you know? And maybe what, maybe it'll catch on, you know, now you watch FX and the, the fucks are flying on FX these days. But I remember when that shit started, the first time I heard a fuck on cable, basic cable television, I was like, whoa, hey, whoa, this is a Christian house. We don't do that kind of stuff here. Even though in my daily life, it's it's said a billion times a day, but then in the in the context of basic cable television, the first time I heard a fuck, I was like, "Whoa, hey buddy, dial it back, okay? That's not we're not we don't do that here." And that that's sort of how it feels to see just like titties walk when you're walking down the sidewalk and you see one of these feminist ass bitches with with they titties out. It's like, hey, this is I you know it's weird because I love tits. But seeing them in that context, it's like, hey, put put a shawl on, uh, a shawl, and a throw an Afghan over these over these puppies. Uh, cover yourself up. This is not the play. This is, now is not the time for this. This is uh, this really has thrown me off. But that may just be, you know, my I've been societized to 
not be able to uh, accept titties in the wild in that way. I don't know. It's it also usually is because if a woman is doing that, usually the kind of woman that would deign to expose her breasts in public is doing so not because it's comfortable for her or she's trying to arouse men the the men around her it's for dumbass annoying reasons feminist reasons so it's that's all it's also that's also a factor usually she's got her tits out and then she lifts her arms up just rapunzel lengths of armpit hair it's like ew you nasty bitch no i don't mind i don't mind a little armpit hair but if it's too long you know if it, if it looks like um you know like brian doyle murray's mustache growing out of her arms armpits you know if she got robin williams ass armpits then yeah, that's not cool but if it's the if it's similar uh if it's a similar growth to um you know like pussy bush you know a good a good pussy bush it also in the armpits then the, you know then it just looks like she has like auxiliary pussies under her arms and that's kind of nice. I don't mind that. <clears throat> um, I have, man, I don't know how, how long I've been talking about this kind of stuff. Now I'm realizing this has been going on for several minutes now. I am criminally horny. I must, must be the mercury you know, retrograde and so on and so forth. Uh, <laughs> man. Where do we go from here? That's probably it for this week. That's it for Lost in the Maze 20. I can't believe we made it to 20, but folks, we did it. Thank you for supporting this broadcast. I feel like I'm I'm definitely getting more comfortable doing this. Like the solo thing is so odd because I have to like figure out ways to have a conversation with myself kind of off the dome. I could write something or outline or have some idea of what I want to talk about. Uh, but for, I think, all of these, I've just hit record and started talking, uh, except for the Beowulf series. And I, Look, we're going to get back to Beowulf. I think next week, I'm reading more Beowulf. But for everything else, I just hit record and start talking. And you can tell that I have nothing planned the way I stumble over my words and lose my train of thought and drift off into these long, meandering tangents. But maybe that's what people tune in for. Who knows? I don't know. It's just it's just a strange thing to do with one's time to try and do this. And um the 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 the, the solo broadcast. It ain't easy. It's also not hard. You know, I'm not doing hard labor. I'm just talking to myself. But I, I have to have like uh some I have to be introspective and knowledgeable and possess uh, some command over uh, over. See, I can. I'm having trouble putting words together. It's probably because I was trying to speak Spanish earlier, and now I'm now I'm jumbled in my mind. I've got two different languages at war with one another in my mind because I I tried to speak some Spanish earlier. I was trying to sing a song in Spanish. There was a there was a song that's sung in Spanish that I really liked that I was trying to sing earlier uh what is it l hold on uh it's from the it's from the album xenophanes xenophanes the i i don't know who is going to know what i'm talking about um Z, xenophanes xenophanes the it's a, it's an omar rodriguez lopez album and omar Omar Rodriguez Lopez is one of my favorite musicians. Um, he's the guitarist for At the Drive in Mars Volta. And he also has this sort of um John Frushante buckethead esque solo output where he's I think he's recorded like a thousand solo albums, which is kind of a misnomer. They're not like it's his name. You know, it's like it's like solo, but it's usually he's got a band. He's got like a whole team with him. It's just this is like the Omar Rodriguez Lopez project, like all these, just all these other ideas that he wants to put out is, is like his solo output. And so there's like a thousand of these things and a lot of them are good. I mean, it's crazy. Like his batting average on this, like how many of these like full albums are really good. Like 
as listenable as any you know any big big time pop or rock album and they you know they're just all kind of under the radar because he's, he's put out so so many of them and there's also a lot of them are instrumental for sure you know if you're into that kind of thing which, like i am they're instrumental which is kind of a niche uh musical category I'm not like it, but this album, Xenophanes, uh, is not an instrument. It, it has instruments for sure. There, there are instruments playing, but there's also vocals. Uh, and I think he sings, he sings on a lot of the tracks. And then it's, it's also one of a, I think a few albums that he does with um, this other singer, this lady, Himina Serignana, Serign, Serignana. Uh, who's like a Mexican pop star. Um, but anyway, it, it, this this was a record. It was weird, man. Like the thing, like what music does. Because this was like a record I I would listen to constantly. Um, years ago, I just, I had discovered it and I really fell in love with it. And I would just like play it over and over and over again, listen to it all the time. And then, you know how it goes with these sorts of things. Like you you, you listen to something a bunch and then, it's there it's embedded within you now but you you move on to other things and explore other uh you know all kinds of art and creativity and just move on with your life and and then this um this thing that you know consumes so much of your um time at one point that you were so in love with has been shelved you know and, and though and, and and then recently, for some reason, I started thinking about this this album again, and I went back and listened to it, and it was like this really bizarre emotional experience for me, where I was just hit with this like wave of uh, joy and sadness, very strange, you know, and amb- ambivalence. If is that the right word? you know experiencing two emotions at the same time that are contrasting <clears throat> where i i like remembered how much i love this record and then was kind of hit with like what's have like everything that's happened in my life since the last time i listened to it and just kind of realized like nothing in my life has gotten better <laughs> and, and and just like at the, at the time when i was like listening to this album a lot it was something that brought me a lot of happiness and like made me feel hopeful in a way. And and then to, to realize like, Oh man, nothing went well. <laughs> that was false hope the whole time. <laughs> made me feel sad, but I, you know, I still love this record. Um, and I, but I was trying to sing along to it earlier, but I had to <laughs> very, I guess I'm just autistic, like autistically, um, it's not well no this is not an autistic why am i associating this with being autistic no i had to look up the lyrics to the song i like uh because it's not even a matter of like i can't understand the lyric i i definitely can't understand the lyrics uh because they're in spanish <laughs> so it wouldn't even be a, a situation where it's like what is it what is he saying i'm not quite making that out it'd be like i just don't speak that language so <laughs> It, which honestly speaks to the power of music because this entire album is sung in Spanish. So I don't know a goddamn word that anyone's saying on this. I don't know what any of this shit means, but if I feel it, brother, I feel it. I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my soul, in my heart, in all my chakras. I'm feeling this one. And I don't know what any of these songs are about. I don't know what they mean. I don't even speak the language, but you know, he, he, this, this has something, this has spirit, this has soul to it. Um, when did this come out? Xenophanes, uh, September 28th, 2009. So this was around the same time that the Mars Volta did Octahedron, which was a polarizing album, I get, I think. Uh, it was definitely, it was certainly a deviation from what they had done up till that point. And then Zenoph, but this this record Xenophanes sounds to me more like a Mars Volta record than Octahedron, which is a Mars Volta record. Um, but maybe that's maybe I'm maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not. Hey, look, I'm no Fantano. 
but I've listened. I, but in that's hey, look, I like Octahedron. It took me a minute to warm up to that album because it was it was so different from what they had done, and uh, it was just it was like very strange to me at first. This Octahedron as a record. But I, I gave it a couple chances. I listened through it a couple times, and a lot of those songs I warmed up on. Pretty much the whole record, I could listen to that album front to back, no problem. Um, the same, you know, had a similar experience with their la- the the album after that, Nocturnicit, which was their last record up until, uh, what was it like, last year, two years ago when they reunited and released a, a new album for the first time in a long, like over a decade, I think. I still have not listened to that one. Their newest one, I'm scared to. Uh, but Octahedron and Nocturnicate were two that I had to really, you know, not work on, not like work hard, but I, I, you know, I had to give them a couple chances, a few chances each, and that really warmed up to them. All that's to say, Xenophanes, the Omar solo album, so, solo, which features Omar, Jimena, Serenyana, Juan Aldrete de la Peña, Thomas Pridgen, Marcel Rodriguez Lopez, and Mark Anderud. Hell, most of the fucking most of the people they're playing on this were in the Mars Volta at the time. <laughs> I think I think Omar, Juan, and Thomas were all like in the band in the Mars Volta at the time at the same time that this album came out. So, you know. It's but it's a solo. It's an Omar solo album. Um. Anyway, the um the second track on the record is called Mundo de Ciegos. The fuck does that mean? <laughs> See, I don't speak Spanish. What? It was. I don't know. I was trying to sing along to to this song earlier, and how did I get on this? Why am I talking about? It? Why have I been talking about this for so long? Um, I don't, I don't remember, but anyway, let me see. It goes, it goes, uh, La, la Vista, La Vista del Vestido Leo de Uno Huevo Recuerdo, La, la Residencia al Dolor, Te se la vez, Libra de Ti, Determinado el Mar al Hielo. Ningún razón o proceso íntimo, método que táctico, necia la conciencia. No te tengo miedo. Grito a la pared. Tu sutura corona. Me Los ovarios de tus ojos negros, escóndete en el sol, señorón, determinar el mal al cielo. Ningún razón o proceso íntimo, método que táctico, necia la conciencia. No, te, you get the idea. <laughs> I was trying to I was just I was trying to sing that earlier. I don't know what any of that shit means. I wonder if there's a way to translate that. What do these fucking lyrics mean? Uh let me see. Um because that's on the genius page, so I should be able to translate that. Mundo de Ciegos. Translate this page. There we go. Man, I love taking I love the internet. I love AI, dude. I hope AI replaces Every job, even podcasting. I don't want to do shit. <clears throat> but anyway, what do these lyrics mean? The side of the dress, the child of a new memory, the resistance to pain, third time free from you, determine the sea to ice, no reason or intimate process, cathartic method, foolish conscience. I am not afraid of you. I scream at the wall. Your coronal struck suit your coronal suture will absolve me. The ovaries of your black eyes hide in the weeping willow, determine the evil to the sky. I am not afraid of you. I shout at the wall. Your coronal suture will absolve me. If I have been bad, forgive me. Forgive me. You know, it's interesting that there, there's like a there's like a fine line between 
poetry and music and, and like art in general and, and just like schizophrenia. Because this sounds like the shit that I heard in the psych wars. It sounds like the shit that I was like coming up with when I was crazy. But it's just, it's just coming from a place of like total lucidity and, and brilliance. But it, it's like reading, like reading those lyrics. I'm like, yeah, this is this sounds like the unhinged musings of someone in the throes of psychosis, which is like what I was dealing with. But I mean, I, I don't know. Like, well, yeah, when I was in that state of mind, I like I certainly felt very creative. Like, it felt like I had this like boundless well to draw from to create and, and uh, actually be artistic and creative. And so maybe. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe there's something to that. Like, I don't know. I like, I, I like, I, I definitely like. People have asked me like, when I was going through that, were there any upsides? Like, was there anything about it that was like felt positive? And it was like, dude, I will say like, I was energetic. For those that don't know, I suffered months and months of uh psych months long episode of psychosis that ruined my life. And people have asked me, like, okay, we know how, how shitty it was and what it did to you detrimentally, but were there any positives? And I will say I was energetic, you know, boundless energy and creativity. Like, I, I just, like, was finally sitting down and just, like, writing down every thought I had and sharing it with the public. Uh, but I felt, like, very, like, you know, locked in creatively. And so, yeah, maybe like that, the, the, the place that the place in which crazy exists is also the place in which um, genius and creativity and art exist. And uh, I'm not, I'm certainly not the first person to posit that. I, that is a common trope. The tortured artist, the, the insane beautiful genius crazy artist um so that's that's nothing new i'm not discovering anything by realizing this um nope nothing new under the sun over here anyway that is the show folks that was lost in the maze 20 uh i hope you enjoyed it i hope you enjoy everything we do here at the network we do it all for you the fans but more than anything we do it so i can make money i love you and Wait, wait, I for wait, I forgot. Patreon.com slash cornfed with Dalton Pruitt. Please subscribe to the Patreon. Five dollar tier, ten dollar tier, fifteen dollar tier, and a twenty-five dollar tier. The twenty-five dollar tier gets you the fraternal order of corn fed decal after three months of being subscribed. So it is effectively seventy-five dollars for a sticker. But when you sign up, you are welcome to, upon your subscription and uh, immediately, you're welcome to uh, shoot me a message, including a list of your enemies, and I will call for a jihad upon them on the show. So once again, that's patreon.com slash cornfed with Dalton Pruitt. Thank you. I love you. End.